thank you for your prayers while we were on our trip. We really appreciate it. It's good to be back in the house of the Lord. Amen. I'll be reading Genesis 22, 1 through 14 from the New King, King James Version. Now it came to pass after these things that God stated, tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. And he said, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering, and arose and went to the place of which God told him to go. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw a place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham his father and said, My father! And he said, Here I am, son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his only son. And Abraham called the name of the place, The Lord Will Provide, as it is said to this day in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. To God be the glory. Thank you. Okay, don't go anywhere. Stay up here. Right. So, we're on the trouble. Let's try to go back to start these slides. We've got to get a little sneak preview of these slides. So, let's go back to the beginning of those slides where it says St. Paul's house. We're doing this. We're flying by the pen. There we go. So, I wanted to share with you very briefly. I could sit here for two hours and say, I'm going to make this like two minutes. So, as you might know, maybe uh, you know, we were gone for about two weeks a over, and we left Topeka, Kansas. This city right here where we're in. We left here on July or June the 13th. And we went in through Indianapolis and up into New York. The idea was this was going to be like a mission trip and a retreat. Kind of all rolled into one plus a little vacation. Think of an Oreo cookie. The Oreo, the, the, the chocolate part on the outside. The inside part was like a mission trip and a retreat. And just seeing what God was up to. You know, God, what are you up to? And and man, it was amazing, the whole trip was. But before I left, I tried to get a hold of some places that we could go and be a part of. So one of these places that I happened to find was uh, St. Paul's House. So if we can go back and just start it. There we go. And even farther back. Even farther back. Where if I was putting my hand in a bag? Because we kind got to have these chronological. Well, if not, we'll just leave it. There. Okay. So Friday morning, we got in there on a Tuesday on like one hour of sleep for me. And we get up at like 5.30 in the morning on Friday, the first day, and we walk about, I don't know, two, three miles, something like that, to get to St. Paul's house. And they were great. And so at 7 o'clock, they let us in, and that was for the volunteers, and they kind of gave us orientation. And then the people started coming in about 7.15 for a little coffee, and then they had a little gospel service from 7.30 until about 8, and then we served people breakfast. And what we were doing there was getting food items lined up for them in bags so they could take it with them. And about 40 people show up, I'd say. And so you can go flip to the next slide. 
And that's the lunchroom we were in down there. You can flip it on the next one if you want. And that's, you recognize that beautiful one right here. Give her a hand, will you? That's a lot. What did you think of that place? Uh, it, just totally amazing. What a blessing it was to be there. They were all open, um, caring, and needing prayer. Just like we all are. You know, we all need prayer. And we got to pray with a lot of people there, just individually, just by visiting with them. Okay, you can go on to the next one. And that's another view of the of the dining hall. It's very small. It's in the basement of one of the brownstone houses. It was in a part of the town called Hell's Kitchen. Did anybody ever heard of Hell's Kitchen in New York? It's in Manhattan, a little part of Manhattan. Yep. And so people were great. People we worked with. I met two young men. One was from Florida. The other was from, I believe, in the New York City area. Man, we just we really connected. And if we ever go up there. I would like to make sure that's one of our main spots that yes. we go to. But uh, they have like an internship program for younger people, and some actually live above what's going on here. This is the basement. The first floor is where we did the food prep and the kitchen, yeah. and the people live up above. They do stuff throughout the week for young people. They have yeah. children's outreach, young people. It's it's kind of like a rescue mission, except they don't have residential houses. Gotcha. Okay, what else do you got on there? That can be stand out in front of us. That kind of shows you down those stairs is where you go to go into St. Paul's yeah. house. But they were great. Okay, what's we got next? So this this was one of the cool evenings. Uh, we were out just walking around. We ended up, uh, Andrew and Gory and I were down in Greenwich Village. We were just kind of checking things out. We got on a boat tour through the harbor. And then we uh, got into Washington Square Park. And this gentleman right here says, God's in New York. It's on his shirt. And Gordon, look at that guy. He's got a sign that says free prayer. Hey, well, isn't that great? God doesn't charge for prayer. I mean, I got to know that. But that's not what he was saying. He said, I will pray for you. Just let me pray. And so he had just prayed for a woman who was back behind me. You can't see her. And she was uh, picking up trash. She's a, a worker. And Washington Square Park is right in the heart. It's got a beautiful arch. You may have been there in New York before and seen it. But the thing is, it was not a place where you saw a lot of prayer meetings going on. It was it was in the middle of, of the city. But this guy was great. He was Will. And so Will and I started visiting, and I prayed with Will. That's what's going on. Glory took a picture. You can see a fountain back there off to the left side of the screen. And so that was just one of those encounters that God did throughout this whole trip. Just people. And I'm telling you, God is at work not only here. He's at work in New York City as well. Sometimes you don't know that, but that's going on. What do you think of that situation? I was just totally amazed at that this young man spending his time out offering prayer for people who truly, truly need it. And one thing he said was he had never seen the response that he saw that day there at that park. And we had been saying here, we've seen people open up to God in a way you've never seen before here at Topeka the last three, four months. And um, I still see it. And... um, Thing things going on up there apparently. And he said he prayed for one guy that had like a bunch of satanic tattoos yes. and uh, he the guy comes up to him and asked for prayer and this friend here named Will said he thought the guy was pranking him, but he went and prayed with him. But this gentleman was sincere and he prayed to receive Christ right there in that park that day. Yes. So yes. just a lot of things like that are going on. Okay, what else have we got up there? That's that's then uh, you heard of the Bowery remember the Bowery boys on TV? That's uh, in a place called the Bowery neighborhood of Lower Manhattan. And I went there on that Monday morning, helped out in the kitchen. We served about 185 people there that morning. Uh, one couple came in from California, San Francisco, and there was a man, a wife, and the daughter looked like she was probably in her 20s. And they said they, every time they take a trip, they always find a place to volunteer at for at least one day. I thought, well, that's pretty cool. But we visited and, and uh, just got to bless people as they came through the line. Uh, no, I said about 180 people came through in about an hour. So go ahead and flip it to the next one if you don't mind. That's it. That's what it looks like out in front there. You know, it's funny. I talked to Barry Theaker about a, a month before that, and we were talking about the mission uh, in different places. He said, well, I've never been to the Bowery Mission. I've heard of it in New York. So now I've been to the Bowery Mission, and we'd love to go back someday. Okay, what else you got there? This was two weeks ago today at a sister church in Jamaica, Queens, New York. It's called First United Methodist Church of Jamaica, Queens, I believe it's. Yeah out there in the middle of Queens, a very multicultural part of town. And that's Reverend Daniel over here on the right, his beautiful wife. They're, I believe, both from, well, Reverend Daniel's from Africa. I think his wife may be. And uh, loves the Lord. He was up at a church in Connecticut and has been there for a year. And so I got to spend a little time with them. And anyway, I'll tell you more about it. But but hopefully we can do more with them. That's a great picture of them. They're just wonderful people. And so I sent him a note yesterday saying we got back. But um, but God just worked all the way through that trip. I mean, I'm talking divine encounters. Even yesterday up in Kansas City, I'm 
God just put people in our path that we were able to just share the gospel with. So, any last thoughts on this before I get into the sermon? I guess that was sort of a sermon. That's, that's the church inside, yeah. Okay, all right. That's inside the church, and there's maybe 30, 40 people in there. That's Reverend Daniel up in front. Anything else? Is that the last slide? Oh, that's my good friend, Brother John. He said, just call me Brother John. And he's a Mets fan, so he said his son is a Mets fan, too. He Mets, the, the Mets play in Queens. They play just up the street. So anyway, that was uh, that's a short version of some of the things that happened during that little ministry trip up there. And we got to see some things. We had a great time. It seemed like the Lord was just opening doors for us everywhere we went. Just a lot of weather. People were so nice to us. Uh, people were, were kind. Uh, the people on the streets, they were they were super. Okay, here's the way. Back to the Bowery Mission. I kind of got there a little later, took the subway, got lost a little bit. But I found a way eventually. But I will tell you, Bill was there, and those, Bill's not going to tell you this, but those workers, and those, they love Bill. And they want Bill to come back. And yes, he was a blessing to them. And they were, one guy was a real gruff kind of when we got there, but when we, when we left, the guy let Bill pray for him, and he was just really nice. It was a blessing. You were a blessing to those people. They want him back. Well, I thought they were a blessing to me. Anyway, it, it was, it was, uh, so maybe we see these pictures and maybe, you know, God will let several of us at some point go up there as a group. I'm, I'm praying for that to happen. So anyway, thank you for bearing with me. I wanted to say thank you, especially today to my good friend, Kirk Nystrom and Camille for yeah. serving in my stead when I was gone. And I heard a lot of nice things about that. It's great to have people I can count on and trust when I'm gone to do some of the ministry. Um, this, this has been a, a really eventful time. A lot of things are going on. I, I wanna, I'm going to try to keep this sermon rather concise because this is communion. I understand. Uh, I, I don't want to rush through it. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to catch up. We started on June the 4th, the last time I was standing here. By the way, I've got to tell you a real funny story. I'm sorry. i got these stories. So yesterday we were out in the front of, the, of our house. And there's a, we have a driveway. Some of you have been there. And, and there's a driveway. And I come outside a minute later. We're already talking to a woman. And she said, I was on the United Methodist Church uh, District Committee on Ministry. And she said, I help, you know, uh, you know, we, I go through this process of having to kind of get approved, I guess, every year. She was, she didn't approve, she was on my team that, 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 uh, that looked at my uh, credentials, I guess you'd say. And, but she said, I, I, I was there that day. And anyway, long story short, she said, so are you going to be back in Oakland or Kansas Avenue? I said, as far as I know, they haven't told me otherwise. <laughs> Today is the start of my fourth year here. Praise God. I've been sure that. That's such a blessing. I, I, but like I said, if, if I showed up today and there was another pastor here, I'd have said, well, I guess I didn't get that message. <laughs> that well, anyway, it's a blessing. But July 1st, 2019, four years, it doesn't seem possible. Um, so while I was away, uh, Kirk and Camille did their thing. They, they gave the gospel. Uh, when we, when I was last year on June the 4th, we started a series on Genesis that's going to take us clear through the rest of the summer. Now, my sister loves the Old Testament stories. Well, if you want Old Testament stories, Genesis is your book. You can read that from cover to cover. From Genesis 1, I think there's 50 or 51 chapters. Phenomenal. And about the last third of Genesis is a story of Joseph. But we won't get into him today. We're going to look at something else. Uh, it's going to be about the story of Abraham and Isaac. So before we do that, I want, I want to give you a quick snapshot. Pretend instead of driving to New York, we're flying. You're going to look down and I'll say, here's uh, St. Louis Arch. Here's uh, Lake Michigan over here. There's downtown Chicago. Here's Washington Monument. Now we're over and we're going to land. So, so we're going to look down from 30,000 feet here at what's going on. So June the 11th was Genesis 12, 1 to 9. That is a story. Remember, the, the last one we were here was the creation story. Remember that? It seems like so long ago, doesn't it? But, but Genesis, the next week would have been Genesis 12, 1 to 9, where Abram, later to be called Abraham, was promised to be the father of a great nation. If he obeyed God's voice and left his father's house, and God told Abram to leave his home country and go to a land that I will show you. I love the fact that Abraham, we'll just call him Abraham from here on. Abraham did not have a GPS system on his phone, didn't have a Rand McNally road map. He just had to go. And he, he had to go one step at a time and trust God every single step. Through that process, Abraham's faith was being developed. He didn't know it, but it was being developed. That's how God works, by obedience. The more we obey him, the more our faith 
gets stronger. So God promises to bless those who bless Abraham, and he would curse those who curse him. He's going to take him to Canaan land, even though it's inhabited by other people. He's going to tell him, this land will be yours, and it'll be for your uh, offspring as well. I like what it says. Abraham builds an altar there to honor God. He pitched a tent. And he continued on by stages toward the Negev, which was a dry wasteland. He, he went by stages. That means step by step by step by step. It, again, it's not like he flew over and just got there quick. You know, you, we could have flown to New York. Well, my wife just left. But we, could have flown, we could have flown to New York in three hours. It took us like three days to get there. But that's the difference. God takes us sometimes in a slower progression to get where he wants us to go. It's going to be on his terms, not ours. So, so God leads Abraham to his new home in Canaan. And, and then we go to June 18th, Genesis 18, 1 to 15. It's the story of three men, one of whom is the Lord. They come to visit Abraham. And they say, hey, by the way, thank you for the hospitality. We are going to give you some good news. You and Sarah, your wife, are going to have a baby here real soon. And that's a remarkable story because Abraham's 100 and... Sarah's about 90. Unheard of to have a baby and a child at that age. Sarah's back in the kitchen in there. You know, she's making, I think, some fried chicken and mashed potatoes and gravy and peach cobbler. And she starts laughing when she hears that. She goes, what? How am I going to have a baby? I'm too old. And, the, and remember the Lord said, why would Sarah laugh? Why would you laugh? She said, I didn't laugh. He said, oh, yes, she did. I found out, you know, reading these stories, Abraham wasn't always the most honest person. Neither was Sarah. They kind of learned to become more honest. Remember, Abraham twice passes his wife off as his sister so he could save his own skin. Actually, it worked out okay for him both times. But, but anyway, sure enough, uh, they got that promise. And here's, here's where I want to share with you real, real quick. Sarah, Sarah's like a lot of us. She didn't want to wait. She, she wanted to take things into her own hands and do it in her time. And so she's like, well... I don't know, Abraham. I ain't seeing this. You know, why don't you uh, go over here with Hagar? You two uh, conceive a child. That'll take care of you. You know, God will understand. You ever do that with God? You're, you're going to just jump the gun. You're just going to push the. <coughs> God, you're going to move it fast enough. Let's move. Come on, God. You know. And it didn't work that way. So sure enough, Abraham is only too willing to go over to Hagar's tent. And before you know it, out comes little Ishmael. When we try to fix things, it always causes a bigger problem. When we try to fix a person, when we try to come in and intervene for God, it always causes a bigger mess. You ever notice that? I can tell you, there's times, I, I'm not going to get into it, but real briefly, there have been a few times in the last few months that I saw a situation I came in and tried to fix. Rather than just letting God deal with that individual. This happened several times. I, could, I can tell you specifically. And... Here's what I learned. Let God work with people the way he's working with them. Let God take them through the fire. If I see him kicking and screaming and wailing, that may be part of that process that God wants to bring them through. My job is not to come in and intervene for God and try to fix a problem, try to get somebody out of that fire. Maybe they've got to go through the fire to get it get uh, that dross burned off, get those impurities burned off, and then God's going to do what he's going to do. But if I come in, I short-circuit it, and now God's going, well, you know, I was doing real fine with that person until you came into the picture. Now, he didn't really tell me that, but, but I sort of see that down the road. Why did I come in and intervene when I should have left things alone? And so if you're a fixer, because I found like, I, I, I'm looking at myself, and I'm going, me, maybe I'm more of a fixer than I thought. Just be aware that, that let God take people the way he takes them. He's working in their life. doesn't mean we don't care about people. We don't try to help them. But sometimes we've got to let people go through what they're going through so that God's going to do what he's going to do in their life to get them to where he wants to take them. That's not going to happen if I come in and try to babysit people and make them feel happy and good. Maybe God wants to take them through the fire. I've got to let God do that. Amen. He treats us all as individuals. Um, so, so back to this story. Sarah tried to fix it. It blew up in her face. Ishmael, there was a lot of problems that happened out of, out of that relationship. As you know, they're still going on today. A lot of issues. And, and I believe God has it all under control, but still a lot of things happen. Nothing ever good happens when we get in God's way. Nothing. And, and when we try to fix things that God was working on, not a good idea. 
So uh, let the Holy Spirit be your guide when you're trying to help somebody. Um, remember what happened. Sure enough, Sarah does get pregnant. Sure enough, she does deliver a child. Sure enough, it, the promise was fulfilled. So even though Sarah jumped the gun with uh, this whole process, and Abraham has the child uh, with Hagar named Ishmael, that was never the child of the promise. The child of the promise was going to come through Sarah, just like God said. And God was going to be faithful to what he said he was going to do. And that was that the child born to Abraham and Sarah was going to be the one through whom this promise was fulfilled. And that was Isaac. And so that brings us now to where we are today. Remember, uh, one quick little aside. When, when Isaac got a little bit older, Hagar's son Ishmael started taunting him and teasing him. And Sarah didn't like that very much. She said, Hagar's got to go. And Abraham really didn't want to get rid of him and, and make him go because he loved that. was his son. But God said, listen to your wife and do what she says. So Hagar's out. And remember, she's in the desert thinking that she's going to die with her son. And God said, no, I'll take care of you. And God was still faithful to them. But God is faithful to his plan. Even when we get in the way, even when we are trying to help God along, he's going to do what he's going to do. He's going to make it happen one way or the other. So today, as we look at this very famous story of Abraham taking Isaac up to the hill, it's very interesting that Isaac willingly goes along. Isaac doesn't get the message up front. I don't believe Abraham said, Isaac, come along. I'm going to take you up on top of the mountain, put you on an altar, and I'm going to stab you to death. I don't think he told him that. But nonetheless, I think it started becoming clear to Isaac as they went along that was going to happen. In Genesis 22.5, they come up with a little entourage, had little, some other people helping them with this trip. And, and Abraham says, hey, you guys, just wait here. We will be back. What did he mean, we will be back? He was being told he was going to slay his son. How's he, how is it going to be we coming back? Well, what it is, Abraham fully believed that no matter what happened, God was going to fulfill his promise through Isaac. Even if he killed him, he believed God was capable of raising him from the dead, even though that hadn't even been done yet, as far as we know, in any of the scriptures that had not taken place. So uh, Hebrews 11, verses 17 to 19, talk about how Abraham believed that God would be able to bring his son back from the dead, even though there was no uh, real deal worked out between himself and God. He just believed God. Something else we often hear is that this was a test of Abraham's faith. Y'all, you've all heard that. Oh, God tested Abraham's faith. But I was reading something about four o'clock this morning, and it said maybe it wasn't so much of his faith, of God testing his faith as it was God revealing his faith. You see, I look at it this way: we have maybe more faith than we even know, and that faith happens through obedience. The longer we are walking in obedience to God, in spite of what the world is doing, and we're not getting our marching orders and trying to blend in with the world, but we're, we're just staying true to God. The more we do that, you see, the more faith we're building up in our account. It would be like if you were working today and you had a job that if you signed a, a, a deal with your employer, it said, hey, if you would like to donate 3% of your income to a retirement account, sign up right here. You can, we'll match it up to 3%. You know, you've seen those, some of you. And so, yeah, I'll do that. And then, you know, a few weeks go by, unless you are really hung up on your money, which is okay. But if you, but, but, if, but a lot of us, we just, it's, it's, it's uh, out of sight, out of mind. We never saw it. We don't pay any attention to it. Maybe once in a year we get a deal, hey, here's how much is in that account. Started out one year at 3000 Now it's like 9000 then it's 20000 Wow, where did that money come from? But it's because it was being added on day by day by day, week yes. by week. Every time you got a paycheck, it was being added. I look at this story with Abraham that way, that Abraham was building up his faith in an account that was available to him, but he wasn't going to need it until he had to have it. And when he needed it, he found out that he had it. And he totally trusted God for that whole process. So so the, the, the thing I want to encourage you today is, we have faith that we may not even know about. It's sitting in this account. But if, you, if you're walking with Christ and you're walking uh, in faith, that, that account's growing. Your faith is growing every day. You might not even be aware of it. Step by step by step by step. You don't have to keep track of it. Believe me, it's generating interest. And it's all because of the grace of God that you're doing that. I want to end today's sermon with a story that I came across this week. 
and it was from Joseph Prince Ministries. I get these on my email. If you've got this, you may have seen it. If not, this story may sound familiar, but I'm just going to read this story. It's called The Sun, The Sun. There was once a wealthy man who loved his one and only son above all things. And together they spent 10 years building one of the rarest, most valuable art collections in the world with everything from Picasso to Raphael. Then war broke out and the son went off to fight. One day the father's worst fears were realized when the war department informed him his beloved son had been killed while attempting to rescue another soldier. About six months later, a young soldier with a large package under his arm visited the wealthy man and said, Sir... You don't know me, but I am the man your son saved the day he died. Your son was my friend, and we spent many nights talking about you and your love for art. And then he held out his package and said, I'm not much of an artist, but I wanted you to have this painting I did of your son as I last remember him. The father found himself gazing at a portrait of his one and only son. And fighting back tears, he said, You have captured the essence of my son's smile in this painting, and I will cherish it above all others. The father then hung the portrait of his son over his mantelpiece and showed it to visitors before any of the other masterpieces. Now, when the father died, his entire collection of masterpieces was offered at an exclusive private auction. Collectors and art experts from around the world gathered, and they were surprised when the first painting on the auction block was the soldier's modest rendering of the man's son. The auctioneer asked someone to start bidding. But the sophisticated crowd scoffed and demanded for the Van Goghs and the Rembrandts to be brought forth. The auctioneer persisted, but when no bid was offered, the crowd hissed for the auction to move on. Still, the auctioneer asked, The sun, the sun, who will take the sun? Finally, a voice from the back said, I'll bid $10 for the sun. The bidder was none other than the young soldier whom the sun had died saving. He said, all I have is $10 to my name, but I'll bid it all for the painting. The auctioneer continued to seek a higher bid, but the angry crowd shouted, sell it to him and let's get on with the auction. The auctioneer pounded the gavel and sold the painting to the soldier for the bid of $10. Finally, we can get on with the auction, someone from the second row bellowed. But right at that moment, the auctioneer announced, the auction is now officially closed. The crowd gathered there was shocked. They demanded to know why. And the auctioneer simply replied, according to the wishes of the deceased, only the painting of the sun was to be sold today. Whoever gets this painting gets it all, every piece of art in this priceless collection. And they also get the entire estate in which it is housed. The auction is closed. And with the swing of his gavel, He left the crowd sitting in stunned silence, staring at the young soldier. And then he says, every time I think about this story, I think of how like the father in the story, God is looking for people who value and appreciate his son. Whoever receives the son receives all of God's blessings. To the one who values his son, he gives every good thing he has. How do we value his son? One of the primary ways is by taking time to hear him. Listen to his words of grace to us and hear what he has done for us through his sacrifice on the cross. See, because Abraham was willing to give up everything, give up his son, who he loved, he received back more than he could ever have imagined. And then just think God gave up his only son, Jesus, for us so that by believing in him, we would have all the blessings God wants to give to us. The way we get that blessing is by doing this. We give up everything for God. We trust in Jesus, and we then receive more than we could ever dream possible. The blessings aren't always going to be evident right away. They may not be physical, material blessings. Our greatest blessing will come when we realize that Christ is walking with us. That Jesus is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And when we realize that our greatest blessing awaits us in eternity, well, like I've said before, The best is yet to come. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this this idea of just trusting you. How Abraham learned to to walk by faith. Lord, we're 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 imperfect just like Abraham. But Lord, we we can we can do it. We we have this capability just to trust you and to walk with you. 
Help us to learn to do that today. Help us to just love you more. Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We have um, a day today that's...